I'm talking about the cell membrane now. And we're going to talk about the cell for the next couple of lectures until, of course, your first exam, which is still scheduled for July 3rd. And we're going to talk about the cell first with the membrane, then we're going to go and talk about the organelles inside the cell, then we'll discuss the nucleus of the cell, and when we're done with that, it will be time for exam one. So the cell membrane is also referred to as the fluid mosaic model. What's a mosaic? Yeah, it's like a picture with all kinds of bits and pieces in it. Uh, makes it look uh, very different with all the different parts to it. Uh, that is what our cell membrane is all about. It is made up of multiple different elements. And so it's referred to as a mosaic. The word fluid means that it is bendable, flexible, very pliable in comparison to being rigid or stiff. You don't want your cell membranes to be rigid or stiff. You want them to be able to move and bend. And our cell membrane is able to do that. If our cell membrane was rigid and stiff, whenever you moved, uh, they would crack. So for instance, you know, you move your finger over and over and over again, and eventually uh, your cell membranes will all crack and your finger falls off. Or imagine your heart, which is beating approximately 80 beats per minute all day long. Those cells are contracting and flexing and bending, but if they are too rigid, uh, then those cells start to crack and break. And there are some disease states that make people's cells too rigid, and these individuals usually don't live very long. They're born with this genetic malfunction, which we'll talk about what that is in a little bit. So the part of the cell membrane that is in most abundance would be the phospholipids. So remember we talked yesterday about the fact that the phospholipids are a double layer and you have all of the polar heads pointing out towards the fluid part, extracellular fluid or the intracellular fluid with the nonpolar carbon tails in between. And so you have this phospholipid bilayer. And again, the majority of what our cell membrane is made up of is this phospholipid bilayer. Now, we're talking about a cell, and every single cell has its own function. It's like its own little factory. It produces certain products that the body's going to use. So certain things have to be able to leave the cell, but then you also have to get certain things entering into the cell so that the cell knows what's going on in the outside world, so it has enough uh, building materials to be able to produce its products. So this phospholipid bilayer, again, remember, it is made up of a fatty substance. That's what phospholipids are. And fats can dissolve in fats. So any type of fatty substance, like let's say maybe a steroid hormone, if it wants to get into the cell, will just dissolve right through the phospholipid bilayer and move into or even out of the cell membrane. Get through the phospholipid bilayer. So we have a little bit of a problem 
because we have to be able to get multiple different types of objects through this phospholipid bilayer. And so what we also have in the phospholipid bilayer are proteins. And so you have these proteins that go all the way through this phospholipid bilayer. And these proteins are referred to as integral proteins. And so you can see them, they're kind of protruding uh, on top and also on bottom of our phospholipid bilayer. Now, these integral proteins, what they actually are is they are a type of gate. So that certain substances are able to move through this gate into or out of our cell membrane. Now, the way I've drawn it is not exactly correct uh, because this gate is actually made up of globs of protein that kind of look like long hot dogs, you might say, or like maybe this pen. And what happens is you have five of these globs of protein that all come together to make this gate. And when these five globs come together, they fit very tightly together so that nothing can go through this gate. It's closed. Okay? But we need certain things to be able to get through our protein gate. So what we're going to do is we're going to have to stimulate this gate somehow. And so we're going to have something come along. Let's say that this is like a uh, glucose gate. We need to have insulin to come along and bind to our gate. When that insulin binds to the gate, it triggers the breaking of hydrogen bonds in our five globs of protein. Now what happens to proteins when hydrogen bonds break? They change, they change shape. Exactly. So what we see with these five globs of protein is they actually start to open up sort of like flower petals. They begin to bend outward. You get them bending, and as they bend, you get a channel or a pore in between these globs of protein so that particular chemicals can get through. The insulin after a while will just fall off. It'll break off. And when it does, all those proteins, all those hydrogen bonds will reform, and those proteins will come back up to their original shape, and it will close the gate again. So in order to open this gate, you have to have something bonding to the proteins to stimulate the first hydrogen bonds breaking and causing those proteins to bend backwards so that you get that channel in the middle. And then when it breaks off, the hydrogen bonds reform, your protein goes back to its original shape. Now, only certain chemicals can fit through this channel or through this pore. So these integral proteins are referred to as a gate or sometimes you'll hear people call them a channel, sometimes people will call them a pore. just depends on who you're talking to. To get through here, we have ions that can get through the gates, or we have polar molecules, or like sugar, we have medium molecular weight molecules. And included in the polar would be water. If we do need water to get across the membrane, it can go through some special water channels that allow it to cross.
So we're able to get very small molecular weight molecules through the phospholipid bilayers. Medium weight molecules can get through the gates or the channels. One of the problems is the really large molecules that need to deliver information into the cell. They cannot get across. These large molecules, for example, would be a protein hormone. If you have a really big protein hormone that needs to get information into the cell, but it's too big, it's too fat to get through this gate, it's got to be able to communicate some way, somehow. And so what we're going to see is without the protein hormone ever going into the cell, it's still going to get the cell to do something. And it's basically going to shout across the membrane to get its message across. It's kind of like, you know, if uh, there was an elephant in the hallway and it was trumpeting out there, it wouldn't be too hard for you to figure out it was an elephant even though you didn't even see it. It got its message across right through the door without you even opening it. Okay, and that's what protein hormones are going to do too. So that's what we're going to talk about now, how these protein hormones actually work. So in this case, to get the message across, we're going to use a couple different proteins in the cell membrane. One is very similar to our integral protein gate. However, sitting at the entrance of this gate is another protein on both sides of the membrane. These proteins sit right on top of our gate and on the bottom of our gate and they close off the channel, they close off the pore, nothing can get through this protein. It can't open and the channel is closed off by the proteins on the outside and the inside of the membrane. These proteins are referred to as peripheral proteins. Now, some type of protein hormone is going to bind to our peripheral protein here. So I'm just going to write protein <coughs> hormone. And that protein hormone has a message that it has to give to the inside of the cell. And that message is going to tell the cell to do something. Speed up production of some chemical, slow down production of some other chemical, whatever it is, this protein hormone has a message it delivers. By the way, what is the definition of a hormone? What is a hormone? I mean, we already talked about the fact that some are made out of fats, we call them steroid hormones, and some are made out of proteins, so we call them protein hormones. But what the heck are hormones? Okay, they stimulate stuff, absolutely. What else? Through the blood. They have to go through the blood, they have to travel through the blood to be considered a hormone. What else? They have to travel. So a hormone is not something that you make at point A and right next door, it stimulates something. A hormone you make at point A, it travels through the bloodstream to point B further away and then does some kind of reaction. That's a hormone. Okay? And so this protein hormone has come from somewhere, traveled through the bloodstream, and jumps off to stimulate this cell. So it binds to this peripheral protein. And as soon as it binds to the peripheral protein, its first job is make that protein chain shape. So we're going to break hydrogen bonds and we're going to get this outside, external, peripheral protein changing shape.
peripheral protein and causes hydrogen bonds to break, and the external peripheral protein changes shape. Now, as soon as this external peripheral protein changes shape, it triggers the next step. And the next step is to break hydrogen bonds in the integral protein and cause it to change shape. So we've had two shape changes. First, we have a shape change in the external peripheral protein, and then we have a shape change in the integral protein. So again, our protein hormone bonds to our external peripheral protein and causes hydrogen bonds to break, and this triggers a shape change in the protein. When the external peripheral protein changes shape, it causes hydrogen bonds in the integral protein to break, and the integral protein changes shape. And you probably can guess, we're going to get a shape change in the internal peripheral protein now, too. So when this integral protein changes shape, it then triggers hydrogen bonds to break in the internal peripheral protein. So once again, our protein hormone bonds to the external peripheral protein, hydrogen bonds break, you get a shape change. The shape change triggers hydrogen bonds in the integral protein to break, you get another shape change. This shape change of the integral protein triggers hydrogen bonds in our internal peripheral protein to break, you get a third shape change. Now, this internal peripheral protein is also an enzyme. This enzyme is called adenylate cyclase. When we change the shape of this enzyme, we also activate it. We turn it on. It's ready to do its job.
Now the job of adenylate cyclase, when it is activated, is to take ATP, adenosine triphosphate. called adenine, and adenine is attached to a molecule called ribose sugar, and ribose sugar is attached to three phosphates. This is ATP. Now here's what adenylate cyclase is going to do. First, it's going to cut these two phosphates off. Now what molecule do we have? What do we have now? AMP, adenosine monophosphate. There's only one phosphate left because we took two out of the three off. The second thing that adenylate cyclase is going to do is it's going to take and bond <coughs> this phosphate here with adenine. Now your chemical is actually a circle. It's a circular structure. So in order to let us know that this AMP is now a circular structure, we're going to call it cyclic. AMP. And we write this like this, the little c for cyclic, AMP. So this is cyclic adenosine monophosphate. That's our new molecule that our adenylate cyclase makes. We get cyclic AMP, and we have two phosphates. Can I take a picture of that? Yeah. You can take as many pictures of the board as you like. The only thing you can't do is video record. You can audio record, but you don't really need to video record because I'm doing it for you anyway. No, I don't let you video record. It's really sad. Um, there was a teacher who did video records of all of his um, lectures, and then he let students video record also and didn't think anything of it. And his administration got a hold of the students' video recordings and put them all on Blackboard, and then they fired the teacher. Because they were allowed to have an online class using the students' videos. Didn't need permission for it. Whereas if I video record as a teacher, everything I record is immediately by law copywritten and nobody can use it. And I like to eat, so I don't allow you to video record. <laughs> that's, that's just. Audio recording, what kind of laws on that? If I audio record, no, the student audio uh, just don't use it against me for a law. I, no, I, I don't. <laughs> they're, they're like the same rules. No, they're not the same rules. Yeah, and I don't. I'm not doing it. No, no, but you're allowed to audio record. I don't mind it. I would let you video record, but I really don't trust people. So it's really sad. Any questions so far? So what's happened is this protein hormone never came inside the cell, but yet it's made this enzyme change shape, and we've been able to take an ATP and convert its shape into cyclic AMP and two phosphates. Does that make sense? 
and the hormone never entered the cell, but it got the cell to do something. Okay? Now, why the heck do we want cyclic AMP and these two phosphates? What's going to happen with these? Well, remember, the phosphates, these guys, they'll bind to proteins like enzymes, and you'll get reactions. So they can bind to any proteins, any enzymes, and get any kind of reactions because that's what phosphates do. <coughs> the cyclic AMP, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, <coughs> it binds to our DNA. And the job of cyclic AMP is to stimulate protein production. So now you just got this cell to make maybe more enzymes, which will make more uh, metabolism go inside the cell. You'll make more product. There you go. You just got a whole bunch done without even the protein entering the cell. Any questions? So one last part I want to talk to you about, and I promise I won't erase anything before you do, are able to uh, take pictures. So we've talked about phospholipids, integral proteins, peripheral proteins. I want to talk about something called the glycocalyx. Okay. Uh, the glycocalyx is made up of two basic parts. It's made up of something called a glycoprotein. And it's also made of something called a glycolipid. Now, remember we talked about glycogen. So the glyco portion of this is glycogen. So what we see on the outside of our cell is attached to some of these proteins are these long branching chains of glucose molecules we call glycogen. And so this would now be considered a glycoprotein. Or you might have these long branching chains of glucose molecules attached to the phospholipids, and now we would call this a glycolipid. Now notice on purpose I drew the long branching chains in different shapes, and that's because on our cells, each of the branching chains are different shapes. So you and I, on every single cell in our body, have about 10,000 different branching chain shapes. And it's pretty interesting because one of the things that scientists figured out was that nobody has the same 10,000 branching chain shapes from one person to another. They're all different. So if you were looking at the branching chain shapes of yourself versus, let's say, your cousin, they would be extremely different. Now, if you had an identical twin, however, your branching chain shapes are identical. So your glycolipids and your glycoproteins are identical in identical twins. Now, if you look at your parents' glycolipids and glycoproteins, they're fairly similar to yours, usually not identical though, but very similar. And your siblings, fairly similar, but again, unless they're an identical twin, they're not going to be identical. Now, the question is, what the heck do we have these for? And uh, in the 1970s, there were a lot of scientists who were looking into this stuff, and they found that this has a lot to do with our immune system. So what they were able to figure out was that in the fetal stage of development, okay, that little fetus is still swimming inside mom, and the immune system is starting to develop. And all these uh, cells have the glycolipids, glycoproteins. And what the immune cells do is they cruise through our body, and in that fetal stage, they are memorizing all 10,000 shapes of our glycolipids and glycoproteins. So that when the baby's born, let's say it picks up a bacteria. 
somebody sneezes on the kid or they put something in their mouth they're not supposed to, there's a bacteria that gets inside of them. Now bacteria have glycolipids and glycoprotein shapes too. And our immune system takes one look at those shapes and says, uh, no, I'm sorry, you are not the right shape, and destroys it. So that these glycolipids and glycoproteins, what they do for us is they allow our immune system to know that these cells belong to us. Now that's also potentially a problem if we want to have, let's say, a kidney transplant, okay, or a heart transplant. Now, if I take a kidney and transplant it into a patient, there is potential for that kidney to be rejected. Now, rejected means that, again, that person's immune system took one look at all the glycolipids and glycoproteins on that kidney and said, uh, I don't think so, and began to kill it. And that's what rejection of the organ is. It's actually killing of that organ by our own immune system. So when we do get an organ transplant, liver, kidney, what it, lung, whatever it is, what we're looking for is we're looking for a donor that has extremely similar patterns of our glycolipids and glycoproteins. And of course, best to have an identical twin because then the immune system would be totally fooled and think that that organ belonged to us. So instead of calling it glycolipids and glycoproteins, what these scientists did is they said, because this has to do with histology, with tissues and transplants and things like that, we're going to call this, because it's a big deal, we're going to call this the major histo for tissue compatibility complex, or the MHC. So we want, if we want to know that the person is compatible, we look to see the shapes of the person's glycolipids and glycoproteins, or the shapes of their MHC. Now we had a teacher here at BBC, she was a teacher here for a very long time, uh, probably 20-25 years, and uh, she had, she caught a virus, and uh, it's called cytomegalovirus. Uh, fairly rare in the United States, but she got this virus. It invaded into her heart, and uh, there's no cure for it, and her heart deteriorated. And eventually, she had to have a heart transplant. Well, they couldn't find a heart that was extremely similar in the MHC to hers. So what they did is, because she was really going downhill quickly, they got her a heart uh, from someone that was close. Would have been nice if it was a little bit closer, but okay, pretty close. So what we do in that case is, we give the person immunosuppressant drugs. And so what we're going to do is give her these drugs to make her immune system super sluggish. It's like the immune system smoking dope or something, okay? It like looks at these MHCs and says, hmm, I know it's not the right shape, but I'm so tired, I don't really care. Just leave it there. Now that is good for not having rejection of the heart, but it's also bad for something else. Because our immune system has to be on high alert at all times to make sure that these bacteria, viruses, and even cancer cells don't take over. So for instance, our cells are going through mitosis all day long, thousands and thousands of times. And every about 10,000th time a cell goes through mitosis in our body, it is a cancer cell. It's gone through mitosis wrong. The DNA is mutated. Now that's no big deal for you and me because that cancer cell floats through our system and our immune system goes, oh, no, mm, you don't belong here, and destroys that cancer cell. But in your patient who is immunosuppressed, that cancer cell is made and the immune system goes, I just am too tired to do anything about this. And the cancer cell is allowed to go off and do its thing. And so unfortunately in this teacher, just a couple of years after she had the heart transplant, uh, she turned up with stage 4 lung cancer, although she'd never smoked, didn't live around anybody who smoked, didn't work around anybody who smoked, 
and it was because mitosis, she just got a cancer cell, and her immune system could not kill it, and within just a couple months, she died. So, and this is not an unusual case. This happens to many of the patients who you can't get their glycolipids and glycoprotein shapes close enough, but you still have to give them an organ transplant so that they can survive, and then hope the cancer doesn't take root. Now, I will tell you one other thing that uh, I find personally interesting. Uh, I do research in MHC here at the college, and one of the things that um, my students and I have found is that MHC also gives you your smell. It creates a certain scent that you give off. Now, the weird thing is, it's not the typical smell that you might think, like, you smell somebody. This is actually a smell that stimulates certain areas of your brain that you are not aware of. Now, one of the ways that we've been researching this is we've been using bloodhounds to trail people. And they can trail people based on their NHC. So, for instance, we did a study with identical twins. Now, if your smell is coming from your MHC, and identical twins have the same MHC, would you think that bloodhounds could tell identical twins apart? Absolutely not. Because the MHC is identical, so their smell should be identical, and according to the bloodhound, it is identical. They don't know how to tell identical twins apart. And it's really, really quite funny. We took some identical twins out to a park, and we took smell from one of the twins, and it's real easy. All you got to do is do something like this. Okay, my smell is now all over this, and the dog can find me just based on this. Okay? We took the identical twins, and we asked them to walk about 100 yards together, and then split off and hide, like behind a building, <coughs> behind a tree, whatever, just hide. And now we brought the dogs out right here with their handler, gave them something to smell of, let's say, twin A, okay? And said, okay, go. Now the handlers didn't know there were twins out there. The dogs had never seen identical twins before. None of them had ever trailed these twins. So we had 18 different dogs, and they all did this one at a time. Nobody got to see what the other was doing. And every single dog, when they got to the split, they stopped. And they smell right, and they yeah. smell left. And you could just see that nose going, <laughs> I was trying to figure out. And then they just picked. And they would run to one of the twins. And when the dog says, tag, you're it, they jump on you. Or they'll put a paw on you. And they would tag this twin. Whether it was their smell or not, they tagged this twin. But they were never done. Every single dog came back to the split and then ran to the other twin and jumped on him and said, tag your it. And they still weren't done because now they would run back and forth and tag them over and over again. And some of them, hysterical, would actually sit in the middle and just howl. <laughs> it's like, I don't know what to do. This is craziness. It was really funny. Really funny. So what we were able to show in that study was that your smell, at least what the bloodhound is smelling, is genetically derived. And we believe it's your MHC. Now, other scientists have done studies on humans, where humans are sniffing out humans, like the human is the bloodhound sniffing out the human. So in one study, it was really very interesting, they took all these brand new babies, all newborn babies in the hospital, they were all uh, less than a day old, all these babies had only been with their mother from directly after birth. So mom got to hold the baby for a little while, and then nurse took the baby away. So then what they did is they waited uh, a little bit, and then they did a lineup, and they did a mommy lineup, and they lined all the moms up. And then they brought out one baby at a time, and they would pass the baby to the first mom, not necessarily the baby's mom. And then they would pass the baby down from mom to mom. There were about 10 moms. 
And as soon as that baby got into the arms of its mother, it started yelling and screaming and rooting around and wanting to eat. Didn't do it with the other moms, but did it with their own mom every time, which would indicate that that child knew their mom's smell. Probably was smelling it the whole time in utero. Now, they also did another interesting study where they took a whole bunch of men and they asked these men to wear these white t-shirts for 24 hours. Sweat in them, sleep in it, whatever. And then they took the white t-shirts and they stuffed it in a big mason jar, shut the lid. And they brought these women in and they had about 10 mason jars and they said, okay, will you please open the mason jar, smell the mason jar, one woman at a time did this, and please write down your emotional response. And every single woman did not know that her husband was part of this whole thing. And when they got to the husband's t-shirt, they all had about the same response. What are you doing? This is my husband's t-shirt. I don't understand what this experiment is. They all actually got a little bit upset. But they, every single one of them were able to pick out the t-shirt that belonged to their husband. And ladies, you've probably done this, like if he has to go away for a while, you know, you've probably had him like rub a t-shirt all over him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, you know. If you haven't, it works. Okay? Helps you sleep better, everything else. Guys, it doesn't work for you. <laughs> and maybe you've had something like this happen to you, like, okay, you know, maybe you're at a friend's house or you're at a restaurant with some people and you don't know somebody else is coming to have dinner with you all, you don't know this person, and the person walks through the restaurant door. And you see them, and you take one look at them, and you have this thought, ew, I don't like them. I don't know what it is about them, but I just know I'm not going to like them. Or maybe you have the opposite. You see them, you look at them, and you think, oh, wow, they look like a really nice person. I could probably be friends with them. Wow. Most likely what happened is if you had a negative or a positive response to that person without ever even talking to them, ever even knowing them, is because they smell like somebody that you either like or you can't stand. And you didn't even know that it was whifting through the air to your nose, and you smelled them, and you had that emotional response to them. And it's not anything of a smell that you can be aware of. You know, it's not like the smell of perfume or anything like that, or the stinky smell after playing a basketball game. It is a smell that your brain gets in the emotional center so that you become aware of that person. There have been a lot of studies done that show, and I really hate to tell you this, but the reason that you pick your spouse is because if you're picking your husband, he most likely smells like your dad. And gentlemen, when you pick your wife, she most likely smells like your mom. So ladies, when you tell him that you're not his mother, well, yeah, actually you probably smell to him a lot like her. <laughs> Matter of fact, there was a company that was making MHC perfume. It went out of business because people were getting mad because they were attracting people that they didn't actually like. Because you, well, who's MHC? Were you spraying on yourself? You weren't attracting people who actually liked you or you liked them. So they just went out of business. There was actually another company, you know, like Match.com. Uh, they called themselves MHC.com. And they were actually doing DNA on MHC to see if they could figure which MHC matched best with which MHC. It wasn't working. We don't know enough about it to do that yet. That could be a billion dollar business. <laughs>